sleep in heavenly
shepherd fear the troubled and low above the earth rang out the angel chorus that hailed our Savior's word. Go tell it on the mountain over the hills and everywhere go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born down in a lonely manger a humble Christ was born and God sent the salvation that blesses Christmas Good morning, CIC. Uh, we're going through our sermon series, Faith Together, this month. First week, uh, we covered the general meaning and reasons why we need to have faith. Last week, we went through the first temptation Jesus faced. The first temptation was about the desire to be irrelevant. When Jesus was tempted, he responded, by, he res responded to Satan by saying, Men shall not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus turned attention away from himself and focused on God. Jesus was able to fight us this temptation, this temptation because he knew what he had to focus on. However, it is very easy for us to fall into this temptation. This temptation is too sweet for us to fight against. The desire to be relevant comes from trying to prove our self-worth. This desire could tempt us to place the core of our faith in self-worth. This will lead us to put faith in people and visible things, ultimately leading to creating our own false idols. When we are tempted by the desire to be relevant, we need to ask ourselves a question. Do I love God? We need to focus on this question and center our faith around the Word of God and the love of God. This is the very foundation of our faith in God. I believe the desire to be relevant is the very first temptation because it can shake our core of our faith. Today we are going to take a look at the second temptation that Jesus faced in Matthew's chapter 4, 5 through 7. Let's read our passage together. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. In verse 5, Holy City means Jerusalem. And the devil took Jesus to the highest point of the temple. There would have been many people present when this happened. The temptation of Jesus took place before Jesus' crucifixion, crucifixion meaning um, the only way for the Jews to worship was going to the temple in Jerusalem. When you look at John 2 14, it says, In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. Jesus later says in John 2 16, Get those out of here! Stop turning my father's house into a market! Have you ever been to a Costco during on a weekend? Before Corona, if you've been there, <clears throat> it was almost impossible to move around. 
It was very small because there's so many people there. Imagine that, but more people in the temple. It was packed with people. Sometimes it's just very difficult to move around. Just like the busy Costco on a weekend, temple in Jerusalem was packed with people. If you were to stand on top of the temple, you would have noticed right away. In Matthew 4, 6, the devil repeats by saying, If you are son of God, from verse 3. He does so to test Jesus again with a desire to be relevant. The devil tries to shake the core of Jesus' faith in God. Afterwards, the devil moves on to the second temptation. While Jesus is being watched by many people, the devil tempts Jesus to jump. The devil then tells Jesus to command angels to catch him before he hits the ground. I believe the second temptation is about the desire to be spectacular and popular. And this is why it is important for us to note verse 6, the devil brought Jesus to the top of the temple where many people could watch the spectacle. If Jesus were to perform this miracle, he would have gained popularity right away. But Jesus didn't. And he said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Why did Jesus act in this way? Today, I would like us to go through three main points together. First, let's, div let's dive into the desire to be spectacular and popular. Secondly, I would like to discuss the danger of the said desire, which is individualism. And lastly, we will go through some practical discipline to stay faithful and grounded in God. Have you ever seen any teen movies? I am sure you at least watched Mean Girls. If you ever watched any dramas or movies about teenagers, there are always two groups of people, the ones who are popular and the ones who are not. Usually in these films, popular kids are men, mean and evil towards protagonists. On the other hand, protagonists either want to be like these popular people or get their revenge on them. This is not limited to the on-screen fictional universe. In our real world, whether you're a teenager or an adult, most people want to be spectacular or popular as well. When I was a teenager, I wanted to be a popular kid in school. I got picked on and bullied for no reason. So I thought if I somehow become one of those popular kids or friends with them, they will not bully me anymore. I remember when I was in fourth grade, I did something that I'm not really proud of until this day. I was recently transferred to a different school because bullying towards me was at its worst. It was a new start for me. I finally had a chance to be someone different. So in order to be liked by popular kids, I did my best to spend more time with them. During one of our PE classes, we had to act our dream job. This was not a solo project, it was a group project. We had to find other classmates who had the same dream job and form a group. At the time, the game called Strawcraft was very popular. I'm pretty sure if you're Korean, you have to know this game. I remember watching professional Starcraft League, League almost every day, and naturally, I wanted to be a professional Starcraft player. However, this wasn't what I chose to play out in the class. Before I committed to a group, I looked around and I examined what popular kids wanted to be. There were about seven to eight kids who wanted to be a lawyer, and there were about only one kid who wanted to be a professional StarCraft player. I could have chosen that one kid and act out what I truly wanted to be. But after thinking, <clears throat> I decided to join the lawyer group. I have never wanted to practice the law, but on that day, I changed my mind. Our group performed very well. We had many people in our group, making it a lot easier to play out to be a lawyer. However, that one kid who chose to be a StarCraft player had to perform all by himself. 
which made it more difficult. He did not get a good feedback, and the teacher who was in charge of the class was not gracious towards him. Other kids laughed at him for his poor performance. I was relieved that I wasn't the one being laughed at, but I knew it was wrong for me to act this way. Others could say that I did what I had to do to protect myself. However, fear motivated me to act this way. My desire to be popular made me act this way to hurt others instead. I realized this story of mine is a little different from others' uh, desire to be popular. Yet, I wanted everyone to know that this temptation comes from both sides. As a Christian, I faced the second temptation many times. When I was serving, I had many joyful interactions with my church congregation. I was able to hear about God's miracles happening in their lives. Hearing their testimonies was one of the joys of, the ministry, of my ministry experience. Sharing testimonies became a normal practice within our church ministry. This practice helped our small group to share testimonies to each other and benefited them in their faith journey and is able to create a strong community together. However, even in this goodness, the devil planted the wrong messages into others. One day I had a conversation with one of my small group members. He told me that sharing his own testimony made him feel very discouraged to share it all. He lived a good and peaceful life. He had a great childhood. He had a great parents and his walk with God and his walk of faith didn't go through much rough patch. When this member heard others' testimony of some miraculous transformation made through God's mercy, he felt his testimony wasn't worth it to share. He was discouraged to share. He thought his testimony wasn't spectacular enough to share at all. This was not just his problem. I also went through it myself. When I'm preparing sermons, I try to think of stories that I went through that match well with the main point of the sermon. As I preached more, I started to run out of stories to tell. I felt like my sermons weren't good enough and wasted other people's time. I wanted to preach a good sermon that would transform others just as other pastors' sermons did. And I noticed that I'm always looking at my notes. And when I see other pastors preach day in and day out, they never look at it. They always memorize it. But somehow, with, no matter how many times I try to memorize my sermon, I just can't do it. So me just preaching sometimes and looking at my sermons uh, just creates discouragement to preach at all. Because I feel like I'm not doing a good job. I feel like I'm not a spectacular or I'm not good at what I'm doing. It creates a weakness in my own self because I feel like I'm not good enough. In our passage today, Jesus was tempted again by the devil. We might believe that this is an easy temptation to fight for Jesus. However, I think the second temptation was tougher than the first. When we look at the beginning of Matthew 4, we learn that Jesus went to the wilderness to fast for 40 days after being baptized. Jesus was away from the people for more than 40 days. Now, can you remember what you did or what happened 40 days ago? I don't remember at all what I did or what happened. My guess is that the people of Jerusalem could have easily forgotten what they saw when Jesus was baptized. If Jesus did jump and commanded angels to catch him, this spectacle would have been the perfect chance to prove that Jesus is the Messiah once more. However, Jesus in Matthew 4, 7 says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. The devil, tempting Jesus with the desire to be spectacular, wanted Jesus to command angels to catch him. The devil did so to convince many to only believe in the power of Jesus as not of God as a whole. With this act, it would have been much easier to gather the new believers. People would have believed the act as Jesus' power and probably would have worshipped only Jesus, not God. 
This wasn't the reason why Jesus came to this earth. Jesus didn't come to show off his power as a son of God. He came to be a sacrificial lamb. His mission was to glorify God and become a bridge between us and God. Jesus yet again turns all glory to God and fights off second temptation. In Henry Nouwen's book, In the Name of Jesus, Nouwen says this, When you look at today's church, it is easy to see the prevalence of individualism among ministers and priests. Not too many of us have a vast repertoire of skills to be proud of, but most of us still feel that if we have anything at all to show, it is something we have to do solo. Henry Now later says this, Stardom and individual heroism, which are such obvious aspects of our competitive society, are not at all alien to the church. He didn't write this a few years ago. He wrote this decades ago. And imagine how much church has changed. It's going to become more individualism, individualistic performance. And we see by the pure number of churches, you see how if that pastor is good at sermons, like you, you're you focusing on not the community aspects of the church, but we tend to sometimes focus on, oh, if that pastor is good at preaching, oh, if they have a good worship pastor. I just agree with both of the statements that Henry Nouwen said in his book. I experienced a similar situation in my short years of serving in Chicago. When I started to f fall into the second temptation, I started to focus on what I could do and wanted. When I was a resident assistant at Wheaton College in my junior year, I wanted to have the best floor community and spirituality. In order to reach this goal, I planned on every single step. <clears throat> I had my own monthly goal of how I wanted to my floor to look. And I talked to all returning students on my floor and shared my vision of what I wanted. When I talked to them, they all liked the idea and wanted to come on board. I was very happy with the progress and felt like everything was going to go very well. However, when the school year started, my plan did not go as I planned. Many of the students who were supposed to return to the floor ended up backing out at the last minute. I was frustrated. I thought they all liked my plan, but why did they back out in the last minute? Despite a few hiccups, I still marched on with my plan. I did my best to help my guys on the floor. Even though I was going through tough times on my own, I had to stay happy for them to help out with their problems. I wanted to be the best RA for them. This mindset of mine wanting to be the best for others did not help either of my ministry or my self-confidence. When, when things weren't going my way, I started to compare myself to the other RAs. Instead of being supportive of, of my fellow RAs, I was jealous, even getting mad at myself for not being good. My ministry for college students was no longer for God. It was for myself. From the beginning, I was tempted by the second temptation. I was tempted, the desire to be spectacular in front of others. From the outside, it looked like I was doing everything for God, everything for the gospel. But in reality, it was for me. When we succumb to the second temptation, we become more individualistic. Being individualistic is very dangerous, especially to Christians. As Christians, we put all of our faith in God and do our best to be more like Jesus. Christians are called to make disciples of all nations and share the good news. We have to invite God in our ministries to help non-believers to know and love Him. However, when we become individualistic and selfish, the focus of our mission to share the gospel gets tainted. Individualism is the opposite of the gospel. If you look at Mark 6-7, it says, Calling the twelve to Him, He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. Jesus sent his despised disciples by two. Sharing the gospel was done in pairs, not alone. Jesus also says in Matthew 18, 19 to 20, 
Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where, where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. We can see from Jesus' teaching that we are supposed to be with others as a community. Individualism cannot bring a full picture of the gospel and Christianity. Jesus died on a cross so that we could be saved from our sins, as long as we believe in the gift of salvation. The gospel was given to us because of the sacrifice of Jesus. If Jesus was individualistic, and if he focused on his own glory, sacrificing himself would not have been a smart move. Being individualistic promotes a mindset that goes against God, that goes against God, against the gospel. It screams, I don't need God. I can do it on my own. It is very difficult to resist second temptation. We live in a world where people demand you to be spectacular. If you look at just any sports, any sports team that you like, uh, every team wants to have that, that next franchise star player. Without the star player, any sports team become very boring to watch. They could lose their fan base without legitimate star players. This is the reason why all the teams do everything to sign a contract with star free agents during the offseason. If you are spectacular, you usually get rewarded from it. When we are constantly surrounded by false message to be spectacular, how do we resist it? Practical discipline to fight against the second temptation is confession and forgiveness. Henry Nouwen writes, through confession, the dark powers are taken out of their carnal isolation, brought into the light, and made visible to the community. Through forgiveness, they are disarmed and dispelled and a new integration between body and spirit is made possible. Confession releases us from an individualistic mind to a gospel mind, where we are supposed to be. Just like Noun said, confession lifts up from the darkness and brings light into us. When I was struggling with the second temptation as an RA, I almost dropped out of my school and faith. I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't take it. I failed and was too afraid to tell the world about it. However, I ended up not dropping out of my school or my faith because of my friends and God. One night, my friends and I gathered together to watch movies and play some video games. After all of our fun activities, one of our friends started to share what he was going through. He was going through the same struggles as I did. Hearing his confession, I gained the courage to confess my own. I told them how I was jealous all of them for being a good RA. My jealousy almost ruined our friendships because I isolated myself most of the time. And after sharing, I felt like I came back under the light of God. Desire to be spectacular and popular can lead you to become more individualistic. This trait could lead you to be more isolated situations. You might live in a fear of what others can find out. In order for you to keep your spectacular and popular persona, you might have to act that way through any situation. This act will only bring darkness in your life. Through confession and forgiveness, you are able to go back to the core of your faith and to God. It is difficult to live our daily life without being tempted. Every day is a battle against temptation to keep our faith in God. Having complete trust in God is challenging when we cannot visually see God at all. It is easier to pay, put faith in things that we can see, such as ourselves. This is why we always struggle with the first and second temptation, the desire to be relevant and spectacular. It is a lot easier for us to put faith in ourselves because we can seemingly control our own outcomes. This is why we are always tempted, by, tempted to be relevant and spectacular. As Christians, our walk of faith is not supposed to be easy. We are always being tempted and it is important for us to remember what those temptations are. So far, we learned about two temptations from Matthew chapter 4. I want all of us to read three temptations of Jesus. 
after doing so, think about your week. Think about a time when you were tempted. I encourage you to share your process with your loved ones to pray for each other and to confess and forgive each other. As long as we have our community and Jesus, a Jesus who died for us, we can fight off the devil and the temptations all together. We can have faith. We can have complete trust in God. Don't be discouraged because you feel like you lost your battle against temptation. Just remember this. Jesus who died on a cross already fought the battle and already won the war for us. And we are saved by Jesus' grace because He died on a cross for us. His blood saves us. Even though we are tempted, do not forget that Jesus is there to protect you. And always remember that there is someone who loves you dearly despite your faults, despite your shortcomings of the temptations. As long as you have that faith in Jesus Christ and in God, you know that you are loved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for to continue our series about faith and the temptations that Jesus faced. Lord, as we go through, we realize that we've been, temp we've been tempted almost every day in every situation. We worry about our self-worth. We worry about what we can achieve. Lord, I pray that we're able to just turn those temptations away and put focus on you, Lord, of what you did on that cross. In Jesus' name, amen. I hope you guys have a good week. It's been a very cold this week, so please make sure to keep warm and please make sure to wear masks when you go outside. And I hope you're able to enjoy your family together and please don't get sick. But if you're worried about your health, please let us know. I would love to pray for you guys. Thank you and have a great week.